Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Amit Jha. I'm Senior Solutions Architect with AWS. Welcome to Windows Workload on AWS webinar. Uh, I'll be joined by a couple of my colleagues, uh, Greg Apple and Akhtar Hussain uh, later. As folks are joining in, uh, we have a quick poll just, just to understand uh, your uh, AWS familiarity level, uh, your understanding of Windows uh, on AWS features, and uh, understanding of the .NET capabilities on AWS. Uh, so if you can take take a couple of minutes, respond uh, to that poll, that will be great. And as folks are joining, we'll give a couple of minutes and we'll get started. Okay, we have good mix here. We kind of have 37 percentage people not, not much aware. There are folks who have done some POCs and some folks who have actually have production workloads, which is, which is good mix. Moving on to our uh, next poll question. This is more around uh, how familiar are you with the Windows on AWS uh, features? Uh, we have been working, uh, running Windows workload on AWS been a while. So just wanted to get how much you guys are aware. So if you can quickly take this poll. Thank you. Uh, I see a lot of folks uh, not aware. This is good. This is the audience we were looking for this webinar. So I'm actually very excited to see this. Uh, so hopefully by end of this webinar, you you will get good amount of familiarity on, on Windows on AWS features. Uh, moving on to our next and the last poll. Any Microsoft uh, shop will have good amount of .NET applications, uh, be it .NET framework based or .NET core based. And AWS, we are also .NET shop. We, we kind of have support for it. We just wanted to see how many of you are familiar with it. So if you can quickly respond there. Okay, that's that's again a lot of folks are not aware. Good, good. Uh, I promise you by end of this webinar, especially the Windows on AWS and .NET on AWS, you will get a good, good understanding of the capabilities. Okay, let's move along now. Okay, let's see. I have access to it. And let me get moving. Okay. So here is the agenda we have for today. Welcome. Again, um, I'll do a good, warm welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, the agenda, uh, I'll be covering the Windows on AWS uh, and the Windows end of support section. And then uh, following which, uh, my colleague, Akhtar, will, will go over SQL Server on AWS. And then finally, uh, Greg Apple will talk about cost optimization for Windows workload on AWS. And then we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, but uh, I would suggest if you have questions, please feel free to uh, use the questions bar and, and post. Our colleagues will be responding uh, to your questions. But we will make sure that we will have some time at the end uh, for Q&A. OK, without much further ado, let's get going. Today's presenter, uh, this is Amit Jha. Uh, and I'll be joined by Akhtar and, and Greg Apple. Okay, so why are customers choosing AWS for their uh, Microsoft workload? If I have to summarize it in one word, it's experience. At AWS, we call there is no compression algorithm for experience. And this is very true for Windows workloads. We started supporting Windows workload on AWS since 2008. So we have had 10 plus years of experience running Windows workload 
on AWS. And no wonder we've been seeing the growth. If you see the 2015 to 2018 numbers, the AWS enterprise customers using Amazon EC2 has increased 400 percentage. So that tells you the customers are trusting us and the capabilities are increasing day by day. Now, it's not just supportability of Windows workload, it's the overall platform, right? Uh, if you talk about global reach and high availability, uh, at a very high level, uh, AWS consists of 20 regions. Each region is two or more availability zone, and each availability zone is two or more uh, data centers. So one, if you compare with other cloud providers, sometimes they make one data center, center equals to one region. So you want, to, you want to be careful around that and understand the real isolation that you get with the AZ model very good isolation because each AZ is separate, yet they are miles apart, and that gives you a right HA and latency-oriented solutions and architectures. Uh, the actual security and compliance, right? Uh, we understand enterprise customers have uh, uh, need to adhere to the local laws and regulations, and AWS has the most number of security and compliance certifications. Um, if it, it starts with uh, like SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3. Uh, we have uh, standards like PCI uh, DSS. We support uh, the, the financial services oriented workload uh, like FIPS 140, uh, GDPR compliant. And the amount of security certification and compliance certification we have is kind of double the numbers of the next cloud other cloud providers. On the platform, the breadth and serv uh, services, the breadth and depth of the services. See, it starts with like core, right? I mean, you have the uh, compute, storage, networking, database, and then on top of it, the uh, higher level services like analytics, AI, ML, IoT, media services. So we pretty much have expanded to support any workload on the cloud. Uh, we are the first one to support Windows Army for machine learning, right? Uh, talk about TCO. Uh, we, we have this internal goal for each service. Like we have to continuously take cost out of their cost structure by doing automation, by increasing efficiencies. And those savings are passed on to the customers. And no wonder why we have reduced our price 67 times. Uh, talk about uh, Microsoft workloads, we reduced the price for SQL Server standard uh, last year. So from this, uh, this I just want to summarize one, the experience, right? You, we've been running it last 10 plus years, not just yesterday, so it's a significant experience. Second, the AWS platform, the availability zone model, that's very, very important, uh, which gives you a right HA uh, and resiliency architecture. The breadth and depth of services, uh, the security and compliance certifications, and the continuous TCO. TCO is continuous. We are continuously innovating, reducing cost, and giving those cost savings to the to our customers. Now, one is actually saying, and second is actually showing you what we've been actually working uh, since last 10 years. This is very quick, rough overview we are, I'm showing here. So we started in 2008, right? Uh, as you can see, we started supporting the Windows Server, and it kind of grows into supporting the latest edition, latest versions, um, and as of now, we support uh, 2019 also. So it's basically supporting the latest and greatest with keeping backward compatibility, right? We moved further to support SQL Server, uh, right? SQL Server workloads, and then supporting the .NET-oriented workloads. So getting the developer lifecycle, right? Ability to do, like, code management, source code, ability to do build of .NET applications, ability to do deployment. So end-to-end -end life cycle, we have that with our AWS code suite and supporting the code build, supporting traceability, correlation, last but not the least, systems manager, right? It's not just ability to run, we also want to have a right day two operations and be able to do the operational task efficiently. We have AWS Systems Manager, which can be used for patching, tuning, and it gives you a lot of other ways in which you can do your operational tasks. So we've been continuously innovating, right? As you can see, uh, 143 instance type, 
60 different army the amazon machine image available for windows workloads and then you have other marketplace uh, solutions idc uh, this is idc survey aws hosts nearly two times as many windows server instances in the cloud as the next cloud provider the microsoft azure so aws has two times as many as windows server so that tells you why customers are trusting aws for their windows workload and it could be for like different types if you think of it it could be the internal applications it could be the uh, external facing applications it could be servers uh, like sharepoint exchange we, we support all those workloads and hence the customers and talking about some of the customers uh, capital one ge uh, autodesk hess siemens they are trusting us to run their business critical workload onto AWS. Moving on here, how are they bringing workloads, right? I was talking about different types of workloads. So if you think uh, there are custom applications like .NET based applications, you could have thick clients like WinForms, WPF, Office applications. You could have web applications like ASP.NET, WebForms, uh, WCF or REST API. Uh, usually, customer starts with like a what you call a lift and shift model. So, getting that running into Amazon EC2 instance because there you get more control and it's more easier migration. So, you can do a VM export import, uh, you can do block by block replication. So, you get onto EC2. Uh, the second is looking for managed services. So, to take an example, uh, you could run SQL Server on EC2, you could use RDS. Uh, for for the same the managed services gives you like there's a terminology that we use uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting right we want you to focus on your business needs look how you can innovate further for your customers and not be bogged down by the undifferentiated heavy lifting hence the managed services like in this case let's say SQL Server uh, we take care of patching provisioning tuning backup restore and that way you are able to focus more on the continuous innovation and do more innovation for your end customer moving onwards here uh, db best one of the uh, awesome enterprise consulting uh, company they actually wrote uh, a couple of blogs one for aws and one for azure like what is the uh, best price performance to run sql server uh, on those cloud providers uh, ZK Research actually took the, that blog information and they actually ran tests using uh, HammerDB, like TPC, like a benchmarking tool. And what you are seeing in the screen is the results of that test. So on the left, you see costs per 1 billion transactions per minute, per month. And in this case, you want to be lower. And AWS came 2x less. So from a price point of view, AWS is 2x cheaper. And on the right, what you see is the performance, the TPN. And in this case, AWS came thrice better performance running it on uh, EC2, SQL Server on EC2. So uh, here is underlying messaging. When Many times I see that uh, TCO is done, right? Those total cost of ownership is done. And somehow what, what I see is Instance type across cloud providers are assumed to have same performance, which is actually in reality not the case. So if you take the same numbers that you are seeing here and you do TCO on AWS and TCO on Azure, once is, uh, one server in AWS will equate to two servers in Azure. Hence, the TCO should also reflect reflective of that. Just, just keep in, in, in mind. Moving along here. So we were talking about migrations. And again, the, the driver for migrations could be different. Uh, sometimes I have seen uh, CXO level uh, decision making where, hey, we want to be 90% on AWS. Uh, we, sometimes it's driven by like um, a data center lease expiration. Like my data center lease is expiring on, let's say, September 30th, and I need to move all of this onto AWS by then. And hence, the architecture type also sometimes get correlated based on the objective. What I have seen in the, in the migrations landscape is customers starts typically with lift and shift. So what we call basically, you're kind of getting comfortable running your applications, your servers onto AWS. 
gain from the AWS operational efficiencies. That's very important. Operational efficiencies, one of the key metric, if you compare AWS with the next cloud provider, Azure, AWS is 7x time less what you call, if you, if you see the number of time AWS went down versus Azure, Azure has 7x more operational issues in 2018. So it's important to look at where you get better HA, where you get better uh, resiliency. So you do a lift and shift. You could use kind of uh, auto scaling to get better uh, resiliency. You could use the AWS HA and uh, multi-AZ, multi-region design. Uh, so that's, that's the first level which I see customers doing. Second is move towards optimization. So optimization could mean, hey, maybe I want to use managed services. So I give you an example, SQL on EC2 versus SQL uh, with RDS. Uh, the same could be applied on Active Directory integration. We have a managed directory service, so you could very well move to take advantage of, of that. Uh, and many times what I see is on-prem, usually you are over-provisioned, right? So when you come to uh, AWS, you will do right sizing. You will gain from that advantage that, hey, on-prem you needed 10 servers to do something, whereas on the cloud, you are good with even four servers because the hardware and the, the efficiencies on the cloud are better. Uh, on top of it, we give you reserved instance pricing, which you can leverage. We have the, uh, the, the different uh, ways in which the programs that can help you to offset additional cost. And the last but not the least is modernization. And this is more towards the applications where you want those legacy applications to be modernized. Typical patterns that we see is uh, a web application or a web services transformed into a containerized microservices, or uh, it could be like a serverless uh, Lambda API gate oriented, right? So you want to gain from the newer uh, architecture patterns, get that efficiency of CI, CD, the DevOps model, so that you are able to innovate much faster on behalf of customer. And for each of these, we provide you tools. So usually in migrations, uh, it starts with like TCO uh, assessment. We have tools like TSO logic, uh, Moveware. We can come in and do that assessment and give you the TCO report for you to make an informed decision. And then for migrations, we have tools and our own services. Talk about database, we have database migration service. Uh, if you want to understand the application de dependency, we have the service, and we have several partners that help you uh, with, with the migrations journey. Moving along here. This is one of the key. Uh, developers support, right? Many of the customers say, we are .NET shop, and, and then I say that, hey, we are .NET shop too. How so? So most of the .NET developers live inside Visual Studio. We have a toolkit, AWS toolkit for Visual Studio. Once installed, the developers will, not, will, will actually be able to do end-to-end -end develop, debug, deployment right inside Visual Studio. So once you install the toolkit, you get AWS Explorer. So basically, you are able to see all your resources, your EC2 instances, your S3 buckets, right there inside Visual Studio. We provide you starter project templates so that you can create the AWS-oriented projects like Lambda, uh, SAM, uh, containerized microservices, uh, we integrate directly. And we also provide you deploy directly from Visual Studio. I mean, most of the enterprises will end up using the infrastructure as code, like uh, uh, CloudFormation or Terraform, or there is a CI CD flow where you actually integrate with AWS code suite, the AWS code commit, AWS code build, AWS code deploy to get that end to end CI CD. Uh, for, uh, and you will say, oh, what about sysadmins? There are like a lot of uh, admin-oriented tasks. We support PowerShell. So we have the PowerShell support. We support the PowerShell core and as well as the CLI. So using the AWS SDK for .NET, you can program against any of the AWS services. Uh, we have the toolkit inside Visual Studio. And we have CI CD integration with our code suite services. Moving forward, uh, I talked a little bit about the directory services. So uh, on-prem, most of the time we see Active Directory, so we have a path to integrate with the on-prem Active Directory. We have a path to install AD on AC2 and set up trust. We have a path to use uh, the managed directory services on AWS. So we, we provide you all, all three options. The managed directory service on AWS is high compatibility. 
So we use kind of all out of all cloud providers, we use the AD on a Windows Server. We, it can preserve SSO and it has rich set of features. So you pretty much can do SAML based federations also. Experience with hybrid. I mean, hybrid uh, starts with network support. So basically, we support hybrid IT architectures. So you can connect your data centers with AWS. Uh, services like VPC, VPN, Direct Connect help you establish that connection. Uh, data, right? We have services like Storage Gateway, S3, Snowball, Snowball Edge help you move uh, data access and data management. And VMware Cloud on AWS uh, allows you to seamlessly run existing VMware workload on AWS. Uh, basically, if you have uh, vSphere, uh, you could pretty much integrate and run the same set of tooling. So. Summary here is customers are offered fully managed service, but continue to use key enterprise solutions, right? Be it from Microsoft, Oracle, or SAP. This is another area, like premier support. How does that work? Like if you're running Windows workload, .NET applications on AWS, what happens in the support cases? It's, it's very simple. You work with AWS support. AWS support does the initial troubleshooting isolation, and if they deem need like need to interact with Microsoft, Microsoft support, AWS support will contact Microsoft support on your behalf and work with them. We have a contract in place so that you don't have to hop between. You work with AWS support, and AWS support engineers will escalate directly to Microsoft support on your behalf. I was talking about partners, right? We have a, a Microsoft competency partners. It essentially means that they've been vetted, they know they, ha they are expertise in migrating Microsoft Windows workloads onto AWS. And we have very large migration partners that can help you with your end-to-end -end migrations journey. And migrations entails a lot of things, right? It entails uh, DevOps, it entails operations, it entails the migration uh, practice establishment of that. Sometimes it could also entail transformation of your organization, setting up what is called Cloud Competency Center, and getting that whole newer uh, DevOps-based uh, development in place. Next, which is very important, end of support. So end of support is coming. Uh, SQL Server 2008 and Windows Server 2008. You see the dates here, July 9th, 2019, uh, and January 14th, 2020. What does it mean, end of support? Basically, after that date, they are out of support. So those, those workloads become at-risk workloads, right? So you, you have to start thinking in terms of what's the next path. Uh, and there are different paths in which uh, you, you, could, you could take, right? Uh, most of our customers that we are seeing is they want to get, upgrade, use their SA benefits, upgrade those, and bring those workloads onto AWS. Uh, and on to AWS, what does it mean? Uh, you must have heard the term uh, six R's of migrations, like um, retain, repurchase, uh, rehost, replatform, refactor, retire, right? These are like kind of terminologies used in the migration space uh, conversations. Very simply, uh, rehost is where most of the enterprise customers start. So basically, getting those workload, let's take an example, maybe SQL Server 20, 2008. You will use your SA rights to upgrade to higher edition, let's say SQL 2016. You get that rehosted onto AWS. Uh, Replatform, you would want to use uh, maybe RDS. Uh, or if you have applications dependent on uh, Active Directory, maybe you want to use the uh, managed directory services. Uh, refactor is more towards the modernization for the application, right? Uh, refactor, essentially, usually, like when you have those application categories, there are applications who are crown jewels, right? They bring uh, revenue for the organization. Most of the time, I see enterprises actually putting more energy uh, on refactor or modernization towards those applications. So that maybe you're, you want to get more portability. Maybe containerization makes sense. Uh, maybe you want to go to a serverless stack to gain from the uh, significantly reduced uh, TCO, right? Uh, sometimes uh, you may want to look to go away from the commercial uh, databases. And I mean, depending on uh, whether uh, the features leveraged, if it is straightforward DML, most of the time we have seen customers actually do assessment. We have a tool called uh, SCT, Schema Conversion Tool, help you take, let's say, from SQL Server to uh, other uh, databases, typically Aurora. Aurora has two uh, database engines, Postgres and, and uh, MySQL. That's, that's another uh, path for modernization. 
Uh, next is basically investment into your licensing. We understand you have significant investment uh, on the licensing and we provide a different path uh, for, so we have support for BYOL, uh, we support for license included, depending on your license term, because sometimes it could be unique to unique customers, um, and your software assurance benefit status, uh, we have different paths to move those workload onto AWS, right? Uh, EC2 has shared tenancy as well as dedicated tenancy. So if you have, like, let's say you do not have active SA, you could bring those workload onto dedicated host. But for licensing, I would suggest talking to the AWS rep, understand the current uh, terms, and then based on that, provide you a right path. Uh, sometimes you could engage us for a full TCO, uh, where we can do the uh, license analysis and provide a path uh, for you. Okay, so with that, I want to summarize quickly. Most experience, 10 plus years running Windows workload. We are not done, we are continuously innovating. Uh, 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 we, are, we are, just recently we launched like uh, CloudWatch App Insight support uh, to do uh, right uh, traceability. Uh, the increase tells you the amount of customers who are trusting us uh, to run Windows uh, SQL, .NET, AD, SharePoint, Exchange, and other Microsoft workloads onto AWS. The AWS uh, region availability zone architecture is the uh, best architecture from a resiliency uh, and latency point of view. The breadth and depth of services, the security and compliance certifications, and the TCO. And continuous price reduction, that's important. Everything starts with customer. All the roadmap items that we deliver is kind of from the customers. 90 to 95% of, of, of our roadmap is driven by customers. And the same way, whatever we gain from the efficiencies inside, we pass on those savings uh, to, to the customers uh, like you. With that, I'm gonna transition uh, to my colleague, uh, Akhtar, to talk about SQL Server on AWS. Hi, this is Akhtar Hussain. Uh, I'm a senior solutions architect in the Microsoft Platform Specialist team. Um, in this section, of the webinar, we will look at the uh, options of deploying Microsoft SQL Server on AWS. And the migration has become significantly more important because of the Microsoft's announcement that SQL Server 2008 will be end of life and end of support on July 8, uh, and then Windows Server on uh, January 14, 2020, as pointed out by Amit uh, just uh, in, the, in the session before. We are just about three months away. So while this is a, is a concern for our customers, but at the same time, this is also an opportunity to migrate off of SQL Server 2008 and 2008R2. Of course, along with the applications uh, that run on these databases. Uh, customer also have a choice, customers also have a choice to consider to upgrade to a newer and a, and a fully supported uh, SQL Server versions and, and take advantage of the AWS cloud economics while still keeping the backward compatibility, uh, backward compatibility to SQL 2008 and 2000 R2 for the applications. Be because of this compatibility, this means far less testing effort for the application. So let's see what we have next. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so, so there are two options for deploying SQL Server on AWS. You can choose uh, a fully managed AWS managed relationship, relational database called the RDS, or run SQL Server on an EC2 instance with attached EBS volume. Now, a good question to ask, well, what options should you choose? Here are some considerations uh, that of course depends on the application that are running on these databases. For example, in-house applications, in-house developed applications, ISVs or third-party applications. And if you wanted to bring licensing, uh, bring your own license onto AWS or cost considerations, whether the application is a business critical application or a non-critical application, uh, you may also think about uh, administrative uh, tasks like backup and restore requirements, high availability and scaling requirements, and disaster recovery, and the kind of RTO and RPO that you're looking for. So let's go to the next slide, please. 
All right. So what you see in this slide is the, uh, is the comparison uh, shows you to get when you get, uh, when, what you get when you deploy SQL Server on RDS compared to managing SQL Server uh, on an EC2 instance. So RDS provides high mobility, backup and recovery, and disaster recovery, encryption, patch management, and other administrative tasks, merely with a few clicks on or checkboxes. The focus uh, then shifts to the business value tasks that your DBAs can perform. In general, customers should challenge themselves to use RDS whenever possible. However, there are a few cases where you may need to use SQL Server on EC2 instances. Uh, and, and depends on these use cases. The use cases could can be the third party applications uh, that may require uh, to run uh, on and, and has not been uh, certified on, on RDS. That is a possibility. Uh, then you have a legacy applications, or if you have Microsoft Software Assurance that you want to take advantage of, uh, of Microsoft Software Mobility and bring your own license uh, onto AWS. So for SQL Server on EC2 instance, you are pretty much uh, uh, responsible for all the administrative tasks, except for the, you know, you can see the bottom two, the power, edge back, and network and OS installations. The rest uh, you will have to manage. Oh, the next, please. Uh, all right. So on this slide, uh, you can see that SQL Server supports, uh, RDS SQL Server supports uh, 2008, uh, 2, 2012, 2014, 2016, 2017. So as new versions of SQL Server are available uh, and we have tested those, we are making it available to in RDS. The volume level encryption and support for TDE, uh, column level encryption is also available. So, and with Windows Active Directory, uh, you can have Windows integrated security or, or a mixed mode you can run uh, RDS SQL Server on. Yeah, next, moving forward. All right. So, so AWS provides a, a pretty prescriptive steps for, for the migration of an on-premises SQL Server, including 2008 and 2008 R2, to later versions of the SQL Server. First, you assess on-premises SQL Server landscape. You take the inventory of these applications, take the inventory of the versions, editions, and the type of uh, applications running on these databases. Next, you use the SQL Server native backup uh, capability, you know, the that dot backup, uh, and you backup the databases uh, using the SQL Server native tools. The next uh, is to restore, restore these backup file either onto an RDS a SQL Server instance or to an EC2 uh, uh, SQL Server instance. Again, uh, here is an opportunity uh, when you do the backup uh, restore, you can you can do it uh, to an upgraded to a new version of SQL Server using SQL Server 2008 uh, compatibility mode. What it means that if you if you are using the compa compatibility mode, uh, then the testing effort uh, hopefully will be reasonably less. And absolutely, uh, the next uh, the next is you realize. Uh, begin to realize the TCO benefits of AWS uh, with SQL Server. All right, going forward. And, all right. So he, here is the migration process, uh, which I discussed, discussed in the previous slide with the steps. So basically you use the natives. Can we go back to the slide? Yeah. So. So, so you back up the backup file uh, onto an S3. Uh, you put it, use the native uh, backup tool and use the backup file and, and send it out to S3. And once you send an S3 in AWS, and uh, you are able to uh, restore uh, that backup file onto an RDS instance or to a uh, EC2 based SQL Server instance. All right. All right, so uh, the slight movement is too quick. I need to go back. Yeah, all right. So the, the this slide uh, is on showing what are the tools that, that you have on AWS 
uh, for the migration process. So the path that you can take is using the AWS tools like the database migration services or uh, DMS and the schema conversion tools. So you can take from uh, the, the, you or use these tools to to uh, to transfer your data or to migrate the data into another instance of on, on, on RDS instance or to a EC2 instance, or you can use the uh, SQL Server native migration tool that which I talked about during the backup part. Uh, what I'm saying is that we recommend that we use the native uh, uh, backup tool uh, capability of the SQL Server to do this. Finally, I uh, want to talk to you about applications that sit on these databases. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, it's important to understand the type of applications that uh, that are running uh, on these databases. Uh, to, I, it, it, this slide shows a, a use case of how a typical three-tier web application leveraging RDS SQL Server looks like. If you have the presentation layer in the front, and then you have the application layer, and then towards the back, uh, to the right, uh, is the is the database layer. Now, in the database layer with multi AZ, uh, which uh, Amit talks about the availability zones with multi AZ RDS deployment, the master node synchronously replicates to the secondary node. Uh, internally, we may be using SQL Server mirroring or always on uh, capability uh, to do this. Should the master node goes away? Uh, the secondary node becomes the master node without having to change the application connection string. The way we do it is uh, is we change the DNS uh, change we make to that to 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 point the application uh, to the secondary node. Well, uh, that's that's all I have to sh I wanted to show, talk to you about uh, on this session. The next is Apple. Apple Greg Apple is going to talk to you about cost optimization. Thank you. Very thanks, Akhtar. So yeah, I'm Greg Apple, a uh, senior solution architect here. We're going to talk about uh, Windows on AWS and, and cost optimization. So we'll go to the first slide here. So um, when you run Windows on EC2, you have multiple options. Uh, th these include on-demand reserved instances and in spot. The one thing to, to remember, these are all purchasing models. You are purchasing, it's a purchase, purchasing model that launches on the same underlying EC2 instance. So whether you do on demand, you do reserved, or you do spot, that's the same EC2 underneath. Uh, it's just a different way to consume, to purchase those resources. So on demand are great for um, spiky workloads, or in the case where you're unsure what your resource needs are. So if it's a new workload and you don't have a good performance profile, um, highly recommend you, you take a look at on-demand first because you simply pay by the hour. So it's fantastic for dev test workloads or workloads that don't need to run 24-7, 365. And so if it's a spiky workload, a workload that doesn't always need to be on or a workload where you don't really understand the performance profile yet, definitely start with on-demand. Um, once you start to understand that performance profile, or you have a very good understanding of what your resource needs are, then I would highly recommend you look at uh, a reserved instance. And so with a reserved instance, you again, this is all the same EC2 resource, but what you're doing is making a one or three year commitment. You can put money up front or you can do what's called a no upfront, where you just pay by each month over that one or three year commitment, and you receive a significant discount off those, those on-demand prices. Um, so it's really, Great, once you understand the workload, and then you have a steady state usage there. Um, and then the third type is called a spot instance. So essentially what this is, is it's giving you spare, it, it, it's allowing you to get a 90% savings off on-demand pricing um, by by using spare EC2 capacity that we have. So it's it's great uh, for any, any workloads that are fault tolerant, uh, that are very flexible and, and ideally stateless. So these are, think of these as your three primary purchasing models for purchasing EC2 uh, resources. And the one thing I want to highlight here too is you don't need to do one of these. You can do, I'd recommend you do all three. Um, so it's really common for folks to, use, you know, they, they have a, a, a baseline of they know that we need at least this much resources, so they use reserved instances. Then they put some on-demand in there, and then if their workload supports spot, 
uh, which a lot of workloads do, then they'll bring spot into the equation. So it's totally valid and actually very recommended by us to, to consider all three of these in parallel uh, when you use EC2. So how do you actually go about choosing the right instance type? So we're talking about those three different purchasing models, but you also have to, there, there, there's a very, I, I don't have a slide here, but there's a, we have a wide range of, of different resource types um, on the platform. So we have, we, the way we label these or name them, we, we have instance families. So you may see like an M5 or a T3 or an R5. So these mean different things, an M, anything that starts with an M is considered a general purpose compute type. So there's a good balance between memory and CPU. Um, we also have a general purpose that's burstable and those are called the T instances. So you'll see T2 and T3. So you get quite a bit of cost savings uh, using those and, and they are burstable in their compute. And then you have other ones that are very specific to one type of resource. So we have the, the R family of, so we have R4s and R5s uh, and those can be very focused on memory workloads that require lots of memory. And then the counter or the complement to that is a, a C family. So C4, C5, those are gonna be very focused on compute. So you you wanna find the instance that makes, that be, that meets those those basic requirements. So understanding is your workload compute intensive or memory intensive should guide you in which direction you should go. So if we're talking SQL Server, SQL Server is a very memory intensive workload, you wanna definitely look at the R family since those are really focused on giving you the most memory uh, for your dollar. So once you kind of identify what family that you, you wanna use, really just, and there's a wide range of t-shirt sizes. So we, we have smalls and two smalls make a medium and two mediums make a large and we go off to four and eight and 16 X large. Um, so you wanna kind of choose the instance family and then try and figure out based on your memory requirements, find the instance that's the closest amount of memory for your, for your needs there. Um, also take into consideration when you start picking these instance types that you need to look for the peak uh, store, IOPS storage requirements. So if you have a workload, again, SQL Server is a good example, um, a very IOP intensive input output, so very disk intensive. Um, even if you don't need lots of memory and CPU, just be aware that the performance of the IO is tied to those, those instances as well. So if you need to do move a lot, say gigabytes or gigabits of, of disk traffic, I mean, you definitely don't wanna look at like a small or medium, but you wanna look at something larger that can handle those IOP requirements. And so that's a good way to start. And then once you've been writing this workload, it gets really important for you to start changing. You can start to right size this, and this is the power of the cloud, the elasticity. Um, so look at using CloudWatch or Trusted Advisor. These are both tools that can help you assess how your workload is running. Uh, so you can actually look at the actual resource usage there, and then you can actually size these instances up or down. And this is why I say don't, unless you really understand your workload, don't do a reserved instance right away. Um, get a workload running, monitor it, gather the data, and then use that to inform your any reserved instance purchases that you make. And then once you've done all this, then you can start rolling this out across, you know, running multiple instances of these across multiple availability zones. So, and the one thing to also remember too is reserved instances, they are not just a, a function for or a feature of Amazon EC2. So it's a very obviously popular uh, service that has reserved instances, but we also have reserved instances for other things like Redshift, DynamoDB, Elasticash, but really within the context of Windows, uh, RDS. So if you run RDS SQL Server, you can still get those same benefits of reserved instances on, on SQL Server and RDS. So just going back to what I said about Spot, um, these are a, potentially have a huge cost savings for our customers and, and for yourself. So you can quite often realize up to a 90% discount over the on-demand prices. Um, and what this basically is going to allow you to do, it's going to allow you to increase your throughput up to 10x while staying within your budget there. So if your workload can work with spot instances, and again, I, I had mentioned the workloads are very stateless um, or fault tolerant. Those are fantastic for spot. And so if you have those type of workload states like a batch processing job, that's going to fit very well into the, the spot model but you're going to be able to get 90% savings on those on-demand prices. So you'll basically be able to increase your throughput um, up to 10x while staying within the budget or what you would have budgeted for on-demand. 
Um, and the spot instances, these are, you know, you can go manually acquire spot instance, but the, there's also some very nice integration into things like Amazon ECS and EKS, which are our container, our Docker and Kubernetes services, AWS Batch and Amazon EMR, um, which also, again, a lot of batch oriented jobs fit very well within spot. So you can use these, these services that have native integration with spot, um, or you can use some, you know, we have third parties that help you consume spot as well. So the other thing to talk about too is, again, we go back to the elasticity of the cloud, the idea of spot and on demand, you only pay for what you use. Um, so auto scale, auto scaling on EC2 plays a really big part in, into this, in this consumption of resources. So from the very basic uh, concepts, EC2 auto scaling is simply scaling up and scaling in, or scaling out and scaling in resources. So you may have a workload that runs nine to five, Monday to Friday, and you know that, okay, we need to scale this um, during those times and then after business hours, then we don't need as many servers. So we can scale back in. We can go, say go from two in the middle of the night up to 20 during the day, and then we can scale back to two after business hours. And so in, in those scenarios, you're gonna look at using auto scaling, using what's called scheduled scaling. So if you understand your workload and, and the input or the, the usage of your platform, um, and it follows a very strict schedule like that, you can simply schedule auto scaling. So it'll just spin up the resources and spin them down um, based on the schedule. You can also do this manually, obviously, as well. So you can just go in and say, I just need more resources and I'll manually do the scaling. Uh, where we really help want folks to, to think about how to use this is around dynamic scaling. So leverage metrics from say CloudWatch to inform when you should scale. Imagine you're running a .NET application, uh, running an IS and you're looking at the request count of the web server. And as you see that go up, you can use that to inform auto scaling to add more resources and then you can scale back down afterwards. Um, and then the fourth option, this is actually our newest option here. It's called predictive scaling, and it's basically it's powered by machine learning. And it's using data collection from your actual EC2 usage, and then it's further informed by billions of data points that we've collected from our own observations. So you can actually start to leverage machine learning without even actually having to understand how machine learning works to do your scaling of your resources. So you can, again, you can use uh, um, Amazon EC2 auto scaling and Amazon EC2 to basically realize up to that 90% cost savings. So you can mix and match a combination of what I talked about, spot, on-demand, or reserved instances. And so you can combine all three of these purchasing models within all the scaling to, to realize that cost savings, to optimize your performance, and really just to eliminate your operational overhead. And one of the last uh, features I want to talk about under the cost optimization uh, category here is something called optimized CPU. So oftentimes you will have workloads like SQL Server. These are gonna be very constrained by memory. They're very memory hungry. And oftentimes to, you'll provision an instance to meet that memory requirement, but you'll have CPU that's not fully, fully utilized. But with those workloads, especially SQL Server Enterprise where you're licensing by core, that's a big additional cost for you. So we released this feature last year. Essentially what it allows you to do is it allows you to optimize your licensing. You can turn down the number of cores uh, turn off hyper-threading based, uh, based on what you actually need, but still get that, the high memory of those instances. So if you're licensing any software by, by core, but especially like a SQL server, um, you can use optimized CPU to, to really optimize the spend on your licenses to make sure you're not spending more licensing than you, you absolutely need to. So um, that, that's it for my part of the presentation. And, and thank you, Amin and Akhtar, uh, for, for talking about your sections here. Um, and thank you guys for joining us today for the Windows Workload and AWS webinar. Uh, we've got a few pop questions that popped up. So I'm gonna start reading through them. I'll, I'll probably get Amit and Akhtar to, to chime in here, but please take a, take a few minutes, put some questions into the chat window. We'd be happy to answer them over the next uh, five to 10 minutes here. So let me uh, just go into here. So this one's probably more for Octar. Octar Heather was asking about how backups are done uh, in, in RDS. I was wondering if you could just speak to that a little bit. How do we take our backups? So the default uh, that you have is to we take the 
you can check box on RDS that, and, and it will do a default backup of every 24 hours of the, the whole volume. Uh, and the, you can put it and the actually internally put it in S3. Uh, and these are, and, and you can choose to make those uh, encrypted uh, backup. And in addition to that, we also take every five minutes, uh, we take uh, the transaction logs. So basically what it means that uh, an R RTO or RTO uh, can be uh, very close to five minutes. So we you restore from the from the for the snapshot, and then you run the the transaction logs. So okay. hopefully that clears up. Yeah, no, it does. Thank you. Um, so I just a few more questions here. We got another one. I'll keep you on on the line here, Akhtar, but uh, I'm probably not pronouncing the name right. Tarang Patel is asking, will you continue to support SQL Server 2008 R2 after end of support, July 19 on RDS? Now I know yes. on the EC2 side, we can we still you can still run Windows you can still run Windows 2003 um, on EC2 even though it's not supported by Microsoft. But maybe you could speak a bit to what uh, RDS and and, and the support. So there's a question on uh, for RDS, what is the typical maintenance outage window? Usually if you run uh, RDS on a multi-AZ environment, so what we do is we upgrade, uh, we, we will do the maintenance on the secondary node. And while you're still working, the application is working with the uh, master node. Uh, and then uh, we will, during the maintenance window that you have provided, we'll switch the two and we'll use the master node at that point uh, we'll do the maintenance on that, and the secondary node will then start beginning, take the take the application connections. Got it. Thank you. And Ahmed, this is a might be more of a question for you. I can answer this too as well. But um, Sharon asks, ECS does not typically work with Windows platform. Is this still a true statement? I would say it's not. You can definitely run Windows containers. Um, and I know we announced EKS support at reInvent for for Windows, but can you talk a bit about the, the support of containers and Windows, Windows platform? Yeah, can you hear me, uh, Craig? Yep, yep. Oh, perfect, thank you, thank you, thanks, Doc. Yes, so ECS definitely supports uh, .NET-oriented uh, workloads. And uh, now here's the thing on, on, like there is .NET framework and then there is .NET Core. Uh, for, for .NET Core, since Microsoft also is pushing more towards .NET Core, the supportability for .NET Core is, is with because it can run on Linux also, right? Uh, so in our portfolio, if you see, uh, we have ECS, where you're using the ECS orchestration uh, engine. We have EKS uh, for Kubernetes, and very soon uh, we'll have uh, the, the uh, .NET uh, with Kubernetes also. Uh, and then there is a Fargate, which, which is more uh, what you call, if you look at the Firecracker, the underlying uh, engine, which is actually creating that those containers and is able to serve the same engine that powers our Lambda, uh, it has two variations, Fargate, uh, again, uh, for, for the ECS and for the uh, EKS. So .NET Core-oriented workloads is a better support, but .NET Framework is also improving as with the Windows container image, right? I mean, it was 19 gig and now we have come to a megabyte. So we are, we are moving there. If there are okay. specific questions, use case, please feel free to ask. Okay, thanks, thanks, Alvin. And Aaron asks, is it possible to use MS SQL replication from on-prem uh, SQL Server to AWS instances for reporting BI? And yes, the answer is yes. I, there's folks, if you're running on EC2, um, you can set native SQL Server replication as long as you have that, that connectivity from on-premise to AWS, so a direct connector VPN. Uh, when we're talking about RDS, it's very common to see folks use uh, our database migration service to do ongoing replication from on-premise to an instance in, in, uh, in the cloud. So it's definitely definitely possible there. Um, let me just see the, lots of other questions here. So um, uh, this one for you, Akhtar, it's from Ashish. It asks, for RDS, what is the typical maintenance outage window? I think you talked a little bit about this, but just sorry. Yeah. Speak. So what we do is we, we will do the management, uh, any, any kind of patch management, uh, we will first test the patch, uh, patch itself uh, internally, and then uh, we'll apply the patch uh, uh, during the window that you specify 
when when creating a, an RDS instance. So you probably probably sometimes you and 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 if you have enterprise support, we actually also work with you. Uh, Premier Enterprise Support. We also uh, work with you uh, on uh, on alternate times that you may you may choose to to de deploy the patch. Got it. Thank you. Um, is there a trial version of resources, SQL Server Express, for example, available to learners? So we do have a, a, a what's called a free tier, and there's going to be certain services that will have indefinite. Uh, free resources and then others that will be time limited usually to a year I think RDS does have a free tier I'm not quite sure if SQL Server ex Express is under that but we do offer SQL Server Express uh, as an option as well within RDS um, so you don't have to pay for the license you know that so if you work well if you're you fit the use case of SQL Server Express that is available uh, on RDS and you can obviously run on EC2 um, There are ways to use tools. Uh, okay, sorry, just one second here. There, there is a question on file stream on uh, RDS SQL Server. Uh, sure, if you I want to take that. To, yeah, I have to go back to see. Uh, uh, when and if it is in the roadmap and and when it is, I, I do not have the answer for that. So yeah, I, I, I would say can, can contact us contact us separately. We will we'll try to respond to that. Yeah, exactly. If you guys, if if any of you on on the line here, you have questions, especially around road, roadmap, in a private conversation with your solution architect, um, we we can have those conversations under NDA. Um, if you don't know who your solution architect is, please reach out to us, and, and we'll we'll help help find it, find out who that is. Um, there is one other. We'll take one more question here. But how does SQL licensing cost work in the case of optimized EC2 instances? So they're talking about the optimized CPU feature. Does the virtual core count or vCPU change as needed by SQL workloads, and that feeds into the lower cost? So just to answer that, when you when you use the optimized CPU feature, you're going to have to set that when you launch the instance. And so at that time, you're basically deciding, I'm going to launch this instance with the reduced core count. So it's not something that dynamically happens based off the, the usage, but it goes back to my earlier point around cost optimization, is run these workloads, run them in, in, uh, um, at your normal scale in the production-like workloads, take those, get those metrics, take those metrics, feed them back into this, and then you can relaunch that instance or, or reconfigure it to, to support the lower core counts. Hey Greg, I see a couple of questions around uh, TFS and Azure DevOps. Uh, let me quickly say we integrate with Azure DevOps. So basically, um, as part of your DevOps pipeline, you could add tasks and and integrate with AWS. And we integrate at each level. Like you can give us the source code, we do the build. Uh, you can give us the binary, and we do the deployment depending on the mapping EC2 versus container versus serverless. So AWS integrates with Azure DevOps, and and obviously the old TFS server also can be configured on on AWS. Great, thanks thanks for that. Okay, so guys, we're we're just at the top of of the the webinar here, so we're going to close this out. Um, we will you will have access to this you'll get access to these slides after after this, um, and then please reach out if you guys have any any other questions. But really appreciate you guys taking the time to spend uh, with us on this webinar.